Well, we're kicking off a new sermon series together today. And over the course of the next few weeks, we are going to be looking at the book of 1 Peter together. And I'm really excited to open this book up because I believe that this has some really important truths which speak into our present situations and our present circumstances. And what we're going to see as we open this book up together is that Peter essentially uh, lays out two major themes as we go through this book. And we're going to see them play out that as Christians, number one, even in the darkest of times, we still have hope. Even when everything feels like it is falling around and we have no control over what we're going through, we have a hope which surpasses all understanding which we can hold on to. And number two, that in the midst of tough times, in the midst of trials and in the midst of everything that's going on, as Christians, you and I are called to live differently. Just a little bit of background into the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter was written by a man named Peter. We have talked about Peter a little bit over the previous few weeks. You remember that Peter was the man who stood by a charcoal fire on the night that Jesus was betrayed and he denied Jesus three times, denied that he had ever even met him. Peter was the one that we talked about on Easter Sunday who jumped out of the boat when Jesus was stood by the side of a river, uh, the sea, cooking fish on a charcoal fire. And he runs up to Jesus and Jesus lovingly restores him. Peter was the man who on the day of Pentecost stood up in front of crowds of thousands and proclaimed the wonders of God and the testimony of what God had done in his life. And he challenged people to follow God. And as a result, 2,000 people or more gave their lives to Jesus Christ that day. And Peter here writes this amazing letter. When we talk about Peter sometimes, I think Peter gets a little bit of a bad rap because we often talk about Peter, don't we, in the kind of terms that he was this uneducated working class fisherman. And to some extent, that's true. But what we see when we read the book of 1 Peter together is that Peter covers some incredibly detailed theological topics. What we're going to see as we read this passage together is he uses terms like foreknowledge. He talks about divine election. He talks about sanctification. He talks about obedience. He talks about the Trinity. Peter was a clever guy. Now you might listen to those terms and think, what on earth are you talking about here, Luke? I have no idea about any of those words that you have just said. In fact, I think sometimes one of the barriers to really opening up scripture is that we open up the Bible and we look at it and we think, I just don't know what this means. Well, what Peter teaches us here in 1 Peter is that it doesn't really matter what your background is. It doesn't matter if you got all your GCSEs when you went to school. It doesn't matter if you went to university and got a degree. It doesn't matter how clever you think you are or how clever you think you are not. If you dig and you search for treasure in the Bible, if you see, dig, dig and you search for the deep things of scripture, they're there for you. You can find what God wants you to know by opening up your heart and opening up scripture and just saying, God, show me your truths. And really, my hope and my heart is, as we look at this book together, that that will be exactly your experience. And that will be what you do, that you go deep with Jesus, that you don't just turn on your computer on a Sunday morning, that you don't just go through the motions anymore. But your heart's longing and your heart's desire is to say, God, show me who you are. Show me who you really are. So my challenge for you today is simply this. Are you passionate about knowing more of Jesus Christ for yourself? Because when we dig for the treasure, it's there to be found. Do you want to know the deep things of him? And if you do, my encouragement to you is to really get into the word. Start reading books about God. Go along to life group, talk to your friends and your family about Jesus. Open up these conversations, because when you do, it will change and transform your outlook and your perspective. So let's start together this morning by looking at 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to start at verse 1 and read to verse 10 to start with. And this is what it says. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, Exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, who have chosen, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit 
to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance which will never perish, spoil or fade. The inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief from all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though it's refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not know, see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end results of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace which was to come searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. When they spoke of these things that have now been told by those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Essentially, what we're going to be looking at as we open up this passage together today are three things. Today, we're going to look at our present sufferings. We are going to look at our future glory and we're going to talk about how we live out our life here and now in everything that is going on around us. And essentially, I think that what we will talk about can be summed up in one verse, which we have read today. 1 Peter 1 verse 3, which says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. From the dead. Peter is writing to a group of people who basically had no reason to hope whatsoever. This was a group of people who understood and knew what it meant to have very present sufferings. Peter was writing this letter around AD 60 to AD 64 when there was a man ruling over Rome called Nero. And to put it mildly, Nero was a psychopath, an absolute psychopath. Nero murdered his mother he murdered his first wife. He probably murdered his second wife too. And history believes that Nero started the great fire of Rome. You see, Nero had a lust for building, absolutely loved to build tall, extravagant buildings. And he wanted to reshape and remodel Rome in his own image. So he went to the Senate and he said, this is what I want to do. The Senate refused and said, no, we're not doing that. So maybe like some pres presidents do in our day and age, Nero decided that he was going to try to bypass the Senate and do his own thing. How was he going to do that? What was the easiest way to do it? To set fire to Rome. So he set fire to Rome and this great fire started, which burned throughout Rome for six whole days. And they got it under control eventually. And then it reignited and burned for another three days. And who did Nero blame on this great fire that had encapsulated Rome? A group of people who were already hated, in fact, a group of people known as Christians. Nero was a nasty piece of work. He would often dress Christians up in animal skins and then he'd lock them in a cage with a pack of wild dogs and watch the dogs ravage them for their entertainment. He would often get Christians and dip them in hot wax, tie them to a tree and then set fire to them. And he would use these burning Christian lanterns to light up his extravagant parties that he used to throw. We read about stories like this in history and it's really easy to forget that these were Christians. These were brothers and sisters in Christ. These were people who have families. These were people who gave up everything essentially to follow Jesus and ultimately pay the ultimate price. And we read about people like this and we so easily 
don't re see what they go through. They knew what it was to really, really suffer. You see, this wasn't a letter which was intended for one person or even for one church, in fact. This was a circular letter intended for a group of churches to help people who were facing horrific times and really hard to comprehend circumstances. A people who were essentially refugees, had no home, lost all their possessions, and for some, it even meant losing their lives. There was very, very little reason for hope. And yet, and yet, Peter writes to this group of people and he says that even in the worst times that you face in this world, even when everything is against you and everything feels like it is crashing down around you, even when humanity is at the most strikingly evil that it could possibly be, even in the darkest of times, there is still hope. And there are a couple of elements to Peter's writing which strike me when I read this. And the first is found in verse 5 when he says this, who, being the Christians, through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is already revealed in the last time. Peter reminds the readers that even though their suffering is horrendous, it is only temporary and that even in the worst moments of life, those will pass away. And even when they are at their most terrible, they can be shielded by God's power and reminded that there is a day which is coming where God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, that there will be no more pain, no more hurt, no more heartache and no more death. And he reminds them that when they find it so easy to give up and to go home and to go back to what they always knew. To look to a God who will shield them. What does it mean to be shielded by God's power today? Well, does it mean that sufferings and hurt and heartache will never befall us and never come to us? No, it doesn't mean that at all. In fact, what we see in scripture is the writing that says those who want to live a godly life will be persecuted. So in some ways, being a Christian, suffering comes with the territory. We should expect to suffer in our lives. But the resurrection power of God and the way he rose Jesus from the dead on the third day reminds us and shows us that once again, because he lives, we will live also. And because he lives, the devil can throw his very worst at me. The devil can knock me down. He can strike me down. He can even kill my body, but he can never, ever take away my eternal inheritance. And therefore, I have hope and I am shielded by God's power. And it means that no matter how bad things get, no matter how weak or ill-equipped I might feel, I have an assurance that there is a God in heaven who can do above, abundantly above anything that I ever ask, think or imagine. And as a result, I can hold on to the hope that God's plans and his promises and his purposes for my life are ultimately good and will ultimately prevail. I wonder if there's anyone who is watching this today who is suffering right now. In some ways, to some level and to some degree, I guess we all are. If nothing else, this situation and circumstances which we find ourselves in shows us once again just how much we are not in control, shows us just how fragile we are. But maybe there are some people who are watching this right now and you have been really, really affected by the coronavirus. Maybe you are ill right now and you are worried because you're finding it hard to breathe and you're just wondering is there going to be an end to this situation maybe you have faced the tragic heartache of losing people in this situations and in these times and you wonder to yourself what is going on i wonder if there's anyone watching this today who feels like they are carrying a load which is simply too great for them to bear. I want to tell you today that God is working. That even when you don't see it, God is working and you can lean on his power and you can lean on him and be shielded by him. You can know the hope which only God offers if you just 
turn to him. I'm not going to go into today why God allows suffering. That's another sermon for another day. But one thing and one thing is very clear when we talk about the context of suffering is that we simply cannot avoid it. We may not have any control over suffering, but we do have a choice in how we are going to respond to suffering. This is where that as Christians we are called to be different. Peter here in these passages lays out the type of response, I believe, which leads to a living hope, even in the worst of the trials. In verses eight and nine, we read these words. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end results of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter essentially reminds us of three things. You love you believe, you receive. Though you cannot see him, you love him. We love Jesus, not because of anything we've done, but because he first loved us. And this is the first key to joy in the midst of suffering and heartache to remember. God's love for us. Focus on that. What he has done for us in the midst of everything that's going on. Our hearts can be filled, therefore, with love for him and our eyes can therefore be turned to him because of his love for us. And what he says, we can therefore know is true. And as a result, we can stand on the promises and receive the salvation of our souls. A living hope ultimately is only found in Jesus. A living hope, even in the midst of the toughest circumstances, means that we can know joy. Joy is different to happiness. Happiness is based upon our circumstances, but joy is something which we can hold on to even when our temporary lives and our temporary situations seem to be crashing down around us. Because ultimately joy is a foretaste of what is to come. So the first thing we learn today is that we will have present circumstances and sufferings, but in the midst of them, there is hope. The second thing that I think this scripture teaches us today is that we need to set our hope on that future glory. So we read these words in verse 13, if we were to go on. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope. You've got that hope. Now set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed in his coming. Have you ever met someone, I wonder, who in natural at least seems to have it all? They've got a good house, they've got a lot of money in the bank, they've got a seemingly good life, everything is comfortable, but yet for whatever reason, they project this persona of hopelessness. They don't feel like their life is even worth living. Equally, I wonder if you've ever met someone who seemingly has nothing when it comes to material value or material worth, and yet, for some reason, their life is so full of hope. I've had the uh, the joy and the experience to go on several short-term mission trips in my lifetime, and one thing that I've noticed every time that I've gone on these trips is that in the midst of extreme poverty, in the midst of death and disease, in the midst of corrupt world governments, some of the most joyous people I have ever met have been in these countries who have absolutely nothing. You see, hope is not based upon our circumstances, but hope is based upon where we set it. If you have hope which is bound up in your circumstances, when the coronavirus comes and suddenly you haven't got your health anymore, suddenly your hope seems to disappear and to drain. If your hope is bound up in your job and your finances, when the coronavirus turns up and suddenly you're out of work or you're on furlough, your hope seems to go. When our hope is based upon our circumstances, ultimately it's very fragile. When our hope is based upon our circumstances, we find ourselves constantly in fear and constantly afraid of what might come. And what Peter challenges us here and challenges his readers is that in our present circumstances, don't set your hope on what's going on here, but set that hope which you have on your future glory. Having a living hope means setting your mind upon Jesus. You see, when our mind is set upon those, those present sufferings, they will consume us. I wonder if you are feeling consumed by what's going on in this world right now. When you turn on your news and all that is on the news is coronavirus and, and everything that's going on around us, it's so easily to feel like we're being consumed. But when we set our minds upon Jesus, 
what happens is we recognise that this world is not our home, that we are merely passing through and that there will be that time where this world will not be anymore. I heard a story a while back about a girl who was captured in Nigeria by a terrorist group called Boko Haram. You might remember that a a year or two ago, a whole group of Nigerian Christian girls were taken from their school and they were kidnapped and led away. And they were held for over a year. But over the course of that year, a number of the girls had started to be released back to their villages and back to their families. But as this went on, it became very apparent that there was one girl who was missing, a girl named Leah. And the reason that she was missing was because her captive said to her, if you renounce Christ, you can go home. If you say that you're not a Christian anymore, we will let you go and we'll forget all about this. And her answer to her captives was, I'm not going to renounce Christ. So one by one, She watched her friends be released back to their villages, back to their homes and back to their families. But when her friends got back, they gave her family a message. And the message was this. I will see you again. If not in this life, when we are resting in the bosom of Christ. How can you have such faith in the midst of such hardship? In the midst of such turmoil, in the midst of such seeming hopelessness, when the weight of the world feels like it's crushing you, by setting our minds on the future glory, by setting our hope on what is to come and not what is now. What is your hope set on today? Is your hope set on the pain and the suffering which might be around you? That is inevitable. It is unavoidable, whether you're a Christian or not. But here's the thing. If you don't know Jesus, this is how life ultimately goes. You're born, you live, you suffer, you die. Ultimately, what we're going through right now, if you have no faith and you have no hope in Jesus, is pointless. Everything is meaningless. But this is how life goes for the Christian. You're born, you live, you suffer, you have hope, you die you're made new. You live with Christ forever. You see, as the Christian, even in the most dire of situations and circumstances, even when for many people hope seems like it's gone, there is a hope to hold on to. And when we we put our hope on the future glory that Jesus offers, we can get through even the toughest of times. So if you're watching this today, let me ask you again, If you're not a Christian, if you haven't put your hope in Jesus Christ, what have you got to lose? So there's a present suffering that we've talked about. There's a future glory which God calls us to set our hope on, to set our minds on. What are we supposed to do in the meantime, though? How are we supposed to live in the here and now with everything going on? Well, verse 17 helps us to understand that. Verse 17 says this. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Let me say that again. Since you call out, you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. So for Peter, and his readers, there was a present suffering, there was a future glory which was to come, that they were supposed to set their hope and their minds on, but right here and right now, they still had a life to live. They still had to go through the day-by-day life that Jesus had called them to. And how did Peter say they should live? Like foreigners. I have been on several trips in general over the course of my lifetime. I've been to Europe on several occasions. I've made several trips to Africa. I've been to Asia and I've loved mostly every trip that I've ever been on. But one thing was really apparent every time that I went on a trip, I realised that eventually I'd be going home. Why? Because I am a citizen of Great Britain. And whilst I was travelling around and whilst I was visiting other countries, I was a foreigner. That was not my home. I had to return to the place of my citizenship, where my country was. And as a result, 
I ended up back in Britain every single time. And this is the mindset that Peter is calling his readers to have here. Not that we end up back in Britain, but realising that we are foreigners in this worldly culture, that we are citizens of a different place, that our citizenship is not of this earth, but our citizenship is in heaven. That is how we should think and that is how we should live. Here is where our loyalties lie, in heaven, not on this earth. We don't need to try to fit into the culture and everything which is going on right here and right now because we are called to be different. We are called to stand out. And when we stand out, particularly in the midst of trials and heartaches, we show people that there's a better way to live and that they can have a hope too. Peter says in verses 22 to 23, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of a perishable seed, but of an imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. Peter basically sums up how we should live, by loving one another deeply. Why? Because we have been born again. We have been given a new citizenship, one which is in heaven, making us foreigners and aliens in this world. So as I finish today, let me ask you, are you suffering right now? Are you finding this situation and this circumstance so overwhelming that it feels like it's crushing you? I want to encourage you again today to cry out to God and he will hear. And in a few weeks time, Peter calls us to cast all of our cares and all of our anxieties upon him because he cares for you. So I want to encourage you to do that today. And the challenge for all of us is in the midst of a cruel world, in the midst of a cruel virus, let's be a people who live differently. Let's set our minds on our future glory in Jesus Christ, remembering that we are citizens of heaven. How we respond to trials and tribulations in times of hardship speaks volumes to a dying and a hurting world. So let's go for Jesus with all of our hearts and with all of our minds. If you are watching this today and you're not a Christian, I want to encourage you today to make that first step to following him. I'm going to pray a prayer and I would encourage you to pray this prayer with me and commit your life to him. Ask him to give you that living hope and ask him to carry you through. We have an alpha course which we're running at the moment and this is a course which helps explain the Christian faith and gives you the opportunity to ask questions and I want to encourage you if you pray this prayer with me to sign up to that course as well. So pray with me right now if you want to receive Christ for yourself this morning. Father God, in a world which feels hopeless, in circumstances which seem horrendous, at a time where I feel helpless, I cry out to you to help me. Father God, I thank you that Jesus came and he died on the cross in my place to forgive my sins and to set me free. Come into my life today, Lord, that I may have hope. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer this morning for the first time, or if you prayed that prayer as a kind of recommitment to say, I'm giving my life back to you again, I'd love for you to comment in the comment section as you watch this. And our online pastor today will be in contact uh, to give you some information about how you can walk with Jesus during this time. God bless you today. Have a great rest of your day.